Hello, everybody. I haven't talked to you in a couple of days. Um, we have nice weather continuing. It is uh, Thursday morning. I'm putting this together. Basically, we've had some low clouds this morning. Um, sunshine is already starting to show up on the satellite picture. I'll show you that in a moment. And then we'll get into our local forecast, which is pretty nice. But I want to start off with Hurricane Lee. You may have already uh, seen this on some of your social feeds or Maybe you've heard about it and you've gone to the Hurricane uh, Center's website and already checking it out because this will be potentially a very big story in the United States next week. So this is the uh, the satellite picture, the visible image. I like the visible pictures because to me, it's just a true snapshot from space. That's exactly what it is. So right down here is Hurricane Lee, 80 mile per hour wind sustained earlier this morning and already starting to show signs of intensifying quickly. Now, to get your bearings on the map, here we are well out into the into the Atlantic Ocean, right? Here are the uh, Leeward Islands. Here is uh, Puerto Rico, and here, here's uh, the Dominican Republic. There's Cuba. Here are the Bahamas up in here. Uh, the track of this storm is going to stay north, I think, of all these islands as it starts to approach the United States. Now, here's what the um, tracking is from the Hurricane Center. My screen grab came out kind of fuzzy here. For that, I apologize. But here's this hurricane growing to a Category 4 storm. And there are signs that maybe Lee could even become a, a Category 5, the strongest uh, hurricane categorization that's given. The extended track, again, keeps it north of the Bahamas and then curls it up the back half of next week as it approaches the United States, keeps the center of the storm off of the U.S. mainland, but curves it dangerously close to the the, to, uh, the coast of Virginia, Maryland, um, into uh, parts of New York City and then on up into New England. So right now, the current track would bring fears uh, let's say a week from this weekend, a weekend from Saturday, uh, high tides into the mid to North Atlantic uh, coastlines of the U.S., potential beach erosion, maybe some of the outer belts of some gusty winds with heavy rains, but beach erosion and high tides would probably be the biggest uh, concern factor. Now, obviously, this track has a lot of days to kind of maneuver itself. Typically, when these storms track this far north, of uh, the Leeward Islands and this far north of, um, you know, staying north of the Bahamas, they typically do not hit the U.S. mainland. But this is going to be a monster hurricane, and it will be very, very closely watched. So we'll keep an eye on Hurricane Lee. Could, there have been some early estimates that winds could get up to 160, even 170 miles per hour with that hurricane. That would be a devastating Category 5. So we'll keep an eye on it. Okay. Um, you may have already seen this too. I haven't talked to you in a couple of days. So I'm kind of throwing everything in this presentation that I found interesting last few days. Remember when we were um, when we were talk talking about this story, Phoenix, Arizona, hitting 110 degrees or hotter day after day after day, and they set their record for doing that 20 some days in a row. Well, meteorological summer, June, July, and August, the National Weather Service in Phoenix saying that uh, the average or the mean temperature was 97 degrees. That's the 24-hour average temperature, counting what the temperatures were in the morning and the afternoon, and you get the mean temperature running for the three-month period, 97 degrees, hottest summer on record, not by a lot, just eclipsing 2020. Now, keep that, keep that figure in mind, right? 97 degrees Fahrenheit. Boy, that's hot, right? That's not much cooling at night. Here are the mean temperatures for our local area put out by the Portland National Weather Service um, for a meteorological summer, June, July, and August. So Portland, believe it or not, we had our third hottest summer on record. Those records for PDX go back to 1941. We came in at just shy of 71 point, uh, just shy of 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Phoenix was 97. So that was, <laughs> we're, we're thank, thankfully 20 plus degrees cooler than them. But at 71.8, it was third place. Uh, let me move my, my face, as I like to say. Here's Salem. You folks came in the fourth warmest summer. Here's Eugene. You folks came in the third warmest summer. Now, what's interesting, and you saw this on that Phoenix graphic as well, if you look at Eugene, in fourth place, warmest summer all time, 1967. But if we erase that year, if we don't count that year, and you look at all the other years on this graphic, all of them are 2014 
or more recently. So are you telling me we're setting all these top five summer records basically from 2010 or 2014 to present day? And the answer is yes. And Phoenix did the same thing without question. Here locally, we are in one heck of a warming pattern over the last, well, I'm going to say since 2000, but, but even more so over just since 2010 of racking up some of the warmer summer days slash months slash seasons that we've ever had. You may recall the hottest temperature this past summer was 108, which would have been an all-time record beating that 107 that stood for so long, except for the June heat wave of 2021, where, of course, we went all the way up to 116. Crazy. All right. So I found that interesting. Yeah, it was a hot summer. Maybe you thought, well, it wasn't so bad, but it turned out to average to be the third hottest summer. Of course, we started off with all those 90 degree temperatures back in May. You, re, uh, you may recall. And, and, and let me say one more thing. So, so far today's what the seventh day of September, Portland's had 24 90 degree days. Now, if you go back to 2016 as the average, and really, the average is quickly becoming more like 20 some 90 degree days. We've had 24 uh, so far. No guarantees we're going to have another one. It's early September. I mean, I would like our odds of maybe having a couple more, but, but we'll see. All right, let's talk about what's going on right now. There's not a lot. This is the water vapor on the left. And right here is a little disturbance offshore. It's producing rain that's been nipping mainly along the Washington coastline. This disturbance is going to weaken and stay offshore. So I don't think it's really a player for us, but it is throwing some clouds, especially up along the North Coast and at least the Long Beach Peninsula. Maybe there's been a raindrop today. Maybe you see a, a, a trace of rain. Uh, so that's the water vapor. Let me move myself. I hope that didn't distract you when I move myself, my face all the, the way around. Here's a visible satellite picture. You can already see some clearing along parts of the coast. Here are the clouds in the valley. It kind of extends south to north and go out through the gorge uh, through Hood River and break by the time you get into the Dalles. These clouds should continue to break up during the day. We're going to come partly become partly cloudy, and maybe even mostly sunny with comfortable temperatures uh, continuing to be up into the uh, up into the uh, 70s. So so pretty nice. In fact, uh, you go down to Lincoln County, the central Oregon coast already getting sunshine. There's the Channel House camera from Depot Bay. That's that hotel. It sits right there. You're literally looking out your window and looking out at the coast and and at the ships that come in that bay. It's kind of cool. And then Domain Serene Winery. So now we're on the west side of I-5 out in Yamhill County, already seeing some breaks in the cloud cover. I think this is what most of us will end up uh, starting to see in the coming hours on this Thursday. Our seven-day forecast, no rain, and for the most part, comfortable temperatures. I do show some warming this weekend. Now, Portland hit 80 yesterday. Today, I've got us at 76. Tomorrow, 81. Could be some early clouds Friday, otherwise mostly sunny. Saturday, clear all day, 87. That's the warm to hot day. Sunday, partly cloudy skies. There's a little wave of cooler weather that comes in Sunday overnight to Monday morning. Should give us morning clouds to afternoon sun and 77. And then Tuesday, mainly sunny, 80. Wednesday, 82. Uh, right now, I show the following Thursday at maybe Sunday and 84. So really, that's slightly warm weather for uh, this time of the year, but, but overall very pleasant late summer weather. I think you will agree with me on that. Okay. Um, I want to switch gears and talk about this El Nino that is believed to be strengthening through the fall months into this winter. Now, what you're looking at here is a very typical El Nino stereotypical flow pattern, which brings ridging up over the Gulf of Alaska Brings a polar jet stream down through the Canadian U.S. border around the Dakotas into the Great Lakes. Provides somewhat mild warm weather for much of the United States. However, on the flip side, the what's considered the subtropical jet becomes stronger than it typically is. Runs along the southern U.S. border. It can bring unusually wet winters into Texas, Florida, uh, the Gulf Coast states, and also California. We would typically, Oregon and Washington, be on the north side of the dry line. And El Nino's can be known as very mild, very dry winter seasons with poor snowpacks in our area. So just kind of refresh your course on that. Now, I'm just personally getting into starting my first work on my winter outlook, which I'll come out with next month in October. But um, and it's going to depend a lot on how strong this El Nino tends to turns out to be or not in terms of 
whether we're going to have a concerning low snowpack or end up with maybe some decent winter weather. So uh, following that, and with that said, I want to spend a, a couple minutes looking at what the models are showing for early flow patterns for the coming months. Um, and then I'll, I'll let you go. So this is the European model, and it's showing areas of above normal precipitation projections month by month. The, the wet areas would be green. The dry areas below normal precip would be in brown. The areas of no confidence to go wet or dry is just white color. Okay, this is the month of September. So notice it's, it's putting out some above normal precipitation patterns in Northern California and Nevada. Of course, Nevada made news earlier this week for all that rain in the Northern Nevada desert. So that's looking pretty good so far. Gives a dry pattern over parts of Washington, near normal precip for our area. Although I will tell you, I think odds are already shaping up to look good that we will be below normal rainfall continuing to be for this month of September. Again, this is the European model. You go to October, kind of opens the door for at least rain chances all the way down to California. There's no confidence here, wet or dry, according to the European model. Look what happens in November, dry, Oregon, Washington, even down into California. That would be interesting. And then now we're getting into December, we're starting to open up a wet pattern in Northern California, not much going on. Maybe we're, we have a chance to see some decent precip November into December in our local area. And then we go into January. This is what's really catching my eye. Now that El Nino is potentially becoming moderately to strong, we're getting into a typical El Nino dry ridging in Oregon and Washington while California is getting hammered with lots of rain. Let's go forward one more month. Look how dry we are in February. There's the rain in California. What this is telling me is that we have a chance, a chance to at least get some decent, maybe be below normal, but get some decent rains in October, November. But then in December is when we would start to develop this dry ridging. And then we could really have a low concerning snowpack in, in December developing into January and February while California starts to get wet. That would be just a, a perfect stereotype. Uh, for an El Nino flow. Here's the American CFS model, climate forecast system. This is the upper flow pattern that you would look to see if that matches what the Euro precip is doing. So here we are in September. This is cool troughing off of California that led to maybe some rains in Nevada that we've already seen. We're kind of in the middle. We've had these kind of weak troughing periods, which actually is the reason that we're seeing a relatively cool start to September, all things considered. So that's making sense so far. Let's go to October. October, more of what we call zonal flow. This shows a big trough offshore. This would give us some hope to get some rain. I mean, if we could get, you know, two and a half inches of rain in October, that would be decent. This, I think, gives us at least some hope to have some decent rain in October. Um, probably averaging below normal, but maybe some decent rain. Now, this is when we get into the big concern. This is strong ridging and dry weather setting up in November. There's some uh, activity of the southern subtropical jet starting to build across Mexico into Texas. Look at this ridging, not as profound, but still there. December, here's rain and troughing starting to set up in California. And then here's January, strong ridging for us. Could be alarmingly dry, not much of a snowpack, some mild temps potentially. And then the rain setting up in Southern California across maybe parts of Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and California. So really that American model and the European model kind of matching up. And again, what I'm seeing right now is at least a chance that we'll get some decent rainfall October into the first part of November. But by the time we get into December, we, we get into potentially a very mild, very dry weather pattern that would lead to a, a not good snowpack at all. And, and would leave us with maybe uh, really, really starting to pray for some rain. So we'll see. I'm just really starting to follow that. And there's lots of times for some twists and turns. But for now, thanks for subscribing to my YouTube channel. If you find this stuff interesting, we're going to be featuring more of, of a kind of winter outlook um, projections, if you will, in, in the coming weeks. I'm Rod Hill.